Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And with me, I am so proud to have who I can call my friend now, Mimi. Um, her name is Mimi Nicklin. Mimi is a lot of things. She wears a lot of hats. She's a marketing and, marketing and um, communications um, specialist. She's a global um, sell, um, author. Um, she heads her own creative agency that is based out of a number of countries. Uh, she has a very a widely distributed team in different um, countries on, the, on different continents. Um, Mimi, I would let you sort of introduce yourself and give us, you know, a bit of a background about you and what you do and why listeners today would leave here with a lot more than even, you know, they didn't expect. Oh, thank you so much for having me and for the introduction. I'm always so excited to be talking into Africa, the continent of Africa. I lived in the South of Africa for um, nearly eight years of my life. And you're right, I work all over the world, but I always feel uh, like part of me is, is on the continent. And so I'm so, so thrilled to be here. As you said, I'm a best-selling author. I head my own agency and my purpose in life, the work I really do is um, spread empathy in our world. And really, I do a lot of that through organizations, sometimes through marketing, uh, but more often through culture or leadership transformation. And what I mean by empathy is workplace understanding. So how do we create more understanding between us as human beings, as colleagues, as friends, um, as leadership teams, in order to overcome some of those segregations, those barriers, that separate us out in the world. And also the reality is we have 30 years of declining empathy. And empathy is what we call an evolutionary skill set. So we need it to survive. It's that powerful, it's that dramatic. Society needs empathy to, to continue to thrive and grow. So my purpose, my mission is to work with brands and businesses to help recreate that in the five sort of days of the week when we're all at work together. Thank you, Mimi. Um, I'm sure um, our audience who mostly, who mostly are uh, marketers and work in, um, um, in business will be wondering, okay, how can I apply this to my day-to-day -day, um, business? So we would cover all of that. Um, so I would quickly say for starters, um, like I said, the audience are mostly business people and, um, and marketers. And when we think about businesses, the primary concerns or primary objectives are two things. You want to make money or you want to save money. So the question is, uh, for businesses, where does empathy feed, fit in all of this? Yeah, it's a great question. And you're right. I, I spend a lot of my time talking about balancing humanism with capitalism. So we are making money with the skill set. We are talking about businesses improving their profit, improving various other KPIs, key performance indicators, whether that is output per capita, profit per capita, uh, team morale, uh, motivation, loyalty, tenure. Some of these have direct implication, of course, on the bottom line, profit per head, those types of things. Some of them, it's more indirect, for example, tenure. So the length of time that an employee stays in your business, of course, it costs the business money to replace people in recruitment fees, training fees, you know, often different salaries. Um, so we know that organizations that have higher levels of empathy also see higher levels of uh, motivation, engagement and stay of people in those in those teams. But as I said, there are plenty of pieces of data now from around the world, many of which are from top uh, American universities that show a direct connection where organizations that have higher levels of understanding, so higher levels of empathy, see improved performance indicators across the board so you're absolutely right this is this is a hard skill right it's a hard skill with hard metrics and hard results um, and people often say to me but is this is this something soft and i say no it's hard to find hard to master and hard to maintain but all the data shows that once you get it right your people and your bottom line will grow so you mentioned a few things and you touched on something that, you know, anyone in an organization keeps track of with his um, KPIs. So mm -hmm. in terms of empathy, how can you tie empathy? How can businesses tie empathy to KPIs? 
Mm. Well, it's it's I would say it's indirect in many occasions because of course we're talking about a human evolutionary skill set. This is not something you sort of, you know, put in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, having said that, what you measure manifests. So it is it is a, a performance indicator that you can measure. Um, and it has to start with culture. If you want to create more understanding in your business, with your clients, with your stakeholders, this has to be something that comes from the top and is imbued into your culture. You have to make sure that your people know that that's what you expect of them. And that this is not just a skill set for connecting with, you know, with your own teams, um, but also in negotiation. If you're working with external procurement teams, if you're trying to invest in loyalty from your key clients or you're trying to sell to new ones, understanding the perspective of the person you're working with, your audience, whether that's, you know, a salesman or a marketing director or an employee, this is the, the sort of key performance driver that we're talking about. How do you put yourself in the shoes of another in order to get optimal business results? And that, of course, can be measured. Okay, so just a follow up to that, um, and I'll just put a bit of context to it. So right now, there are a number of um, macroeconomic factors that businesses are dealing with. Talk about the economic downturn, talk about um, double digit inflation rates in, in lots of countries in Africa, for instance. Um, talk about the layoffs in technology industries around the world, talking about like, millions of people who have been, people who have been um, laid off, and even the threat of um, chat GPT, people have, you know, sort of, how do you, how does that replace the humanity in, uh, you know, business, both internally and externally? So my question is, that my question is sort of three prong. So mm. considering all of this, how can businesses demonstrate empathy internally with their staff and externally between the business and customers? And then the third one is for the business itself, to what extent do businesses deserve empathy? That last one is a great one. Um, but the first two also really valuable questions. So fundamentally, empathy is a data set. Okay, so empathy is your ability to understand the context of others or another, right? So I often say that this is, a, is humanity's data set, but it's a business data set, right? The more you understand those around you, the more you're able to perform, behave, change, transform, whatever it is in the way that that group or that person needs you to. So with your employees, the backbone to empathy is listening. So this year, I predict we're going to see the beginning of what I call listening leadership or the listening led organization, which is fundamentally a shift to when organizations make it explicitly clear that they are hearing their staff, right? That they are listening to their employees and they're able to respond to that. That doesn't always mean action. So empathy is both action, judgment free, right? It, you don't have to agree with someone to empathize. You don't have to act to empathize. You simply have to understand. So when it comes to your employees, making sure that you're a listening led business, that your leadership teams are listening, the line managers are listening, that people feel free to express their opinions, to share ideas, that there are that pot potentially a, an environment where risk taking is not is not scary, right? You're allowed to speak up and say, listen, I, I disagree with your opinion. Um, that is, I would say, one of the biggest steps to, to engaging your employees. There are, there are various other ways you can do that in terms of how you measure it with HR, um, ways that you can create engagement in the workforce, but fundamentally, it comes back to that ability to listen. And I would say that with your customers, to your second question, this is a very similar reality. And in this case, I would say curiosity, so question making, is probably your key to that real customer empathy. Ask them why, and ask them why often. Why are you changing the contract? But why did you come to that decision? But why did you get to that decision? But what led you to get there, right? The more curious you are, the deeper the insight around the information you get back, and the more heard those people feel. And that is, as I said earlier, is evolutionary. So from a subconscious level, when people feel heard, when they think you're paying attention, they give you more information, they trust you more, they build deeper relationships, there's higher levels of loyalty. So simply the act of listening will create better relationships, but the output of that listening will give you more insight to create better relationships. So the whole thing goes around in a cycle. And in my book, 
softening the edge, which you can see behind me. I actually have a, a part of the book where I talk about the five whys. And that is an exercise that any business can use. Um, and it really simply put, if you ask why five times to anyone, your business associate, your team, your child, it doesn't matter. I was going to see your child. Yeah, that's what it works. Do, right? Why, it, why, why? Yeah, yeah, it works. Um, what you'll find is that the first answer and the fifth answer are very different. So perhaps your audience, I wasn't going to do this, but perhaps they would like to when they watch this. So I will say to, to your audience, write down on your paper when you're listening to this, um, what was the last thing you bought in the supermarket and why? And then ask yourself why four more times. And I do this often in my live uh, sessions. And it's amazing because the first one you'll say, well, I bought, I don't know, apples to make an apple cake. But by the time you get to the fifth why, you'll be in a very different emotional territory. Why were you making an apple cake? For who? Why did they want one? Why were you celebrating? How do you feel about that? Okay. The shift from the first why to the last is amazing. So if you're listening, give it a go. But certainly to your question with your customers, simply by being inquisitive, by being curious, by asking them why, you're able to, to build those relationships. And your third question was, I think, do businesses deserve empathy? You meant from community, from the society around them? No, because um, I was actually chatting with um, someone and we're talking about, like I said, you know, the massive layoffs. And then, you know, the discussion was around businesses just don't wake up and think they want to just, you know, slash their workforce and put people out of jobs, you know, but they have to be sustainable. You know, so, uh, you know, from a business perspective, so we, a lot of time we look at it from the employee's perspective. So to what degree should we look at it from the business perspective, you know, that the business, you know, obviously just didn't choose, you know, this path, but it was something that needed to be done for X, Y, and Z reasons. Mm. So to what degree, you know, do we, should I extend empathy to the mm. business? Look, I think if you define empathy as I as I did earlier, which is that this is a data set, this is simply evidence, it's understanding, then of course we can all apply plenty of empathy to organizations. Do we like what we're doing? Do we agree with their decision? Perhaps not, but that's not empathy, right? That moves into agreement, judgment, sympathy, anger, many other emotional things. The act of empathy is to understand, and you just said it also exactly, you know, businesses are in business to make money. They don't just wake up and fire everyone, what's well, unlikely, they're doing it for a reason. However, I would say that from the business, the brand side, to act with empathy, to understand that the people you are laying off or making redundancies, uh, the impact on their lives, and to do that with understanding, with empathy, is a different uh, is a different thing, and and then of course they're going to gain far more support from those people, from people they make redundant, from the people around them, the community. What we see today is that the B two B, the business to business brand, or what often people are calling B two E, so business to employee brands, are hugely hugely important, um, even in B two C, business to consumer marketing, right? Because for example, like you touched on earlier, these tech layoffs around the world, you know. I open my LinkedIn and I see Facebook or Google or Twitter, whoever, you know, making 12,000 people, you know, redundant at five in the morning on a WhatsApp. Of course, as a consumer, I think I don't want anything to do with that brand anymore. Right. It's so it's the how. Yeah, the how it's the how. Yeah. It's the how. If you have to make those decisions, you know, how can you do that in a way that understands that people have, you know, lives and families and structures to maintain? So. We can't always be kind, you know, and I think often people think that to empathize is to be kind. And we can't, right? Sometimes we have to do things that the business demands, but you can do it with understanding. So for example, perhaps it's helping people rewrite their CVs, uh, helping connect them to networking events in the city, yeah. um, helping them perfect their final project with you so that it looks good enough, you know, to sell on to a yeah. new employer, sending them a reference, many other things that you can do to help people on their way on that journey that shows understanding in their future. Yeah, I think that's really, really helpful, Mimi, because a lot of time I don't think, you know, so organizations will probably think, you know, if this is a decision that needs to be, to be done, that this is what it is. But to your point, 
the how and how can you sort of help people, you know, pass um, the situation, you know, can also be um, in, impactful. And I'll just go back to your responses to the first two questions. You talked about listening leadership, you mm -hmm. know, from the first point about internal um, empathy. But how do you think so if you think about two different types of businesses so like a startup where there's you know high level of agility and speed to execution sometimes the structures are flat you know mm -hmm. and it's easy for you know um, employee management type conversation that can help with you know um, listening leadership but when we talk about really huge multinational organizations you know that already have you know set processes you know, they have stru set structures in place, how easy can, you know, listening leadership be, be applied? You know, mm -hmm. that's on that hand. Uh, let me let you answer that, then I'll probably mm -hmm. just go into the second point around um, listening to customers. Yeah, look, I think, I think there's a couple of things. Number one, um, all businesses, however big, have microcosms, right? So they have teams or departments or specialists or niches of some form, right? So within those smaller groups, you can imbue listening leadership, right? So if it comes from the top and they are inspiring and training and, and sharing with all of their leaders, this is the organization we are. We listen to our teams, we respect them, we hear them, all of these types of things then that can be imbued into all the different pockets, however big the business. And I do quite a lot of this now in India. Some of these teams are 12,000 people, right? So it's not instant. You can't listen to 12,000 people immediately, but you can create the intention to be a listening led organization and start to break that down into those smaller teams within those 12 or 100,000 people. That would be the first thing. The second would be to allow feedback loops and, you know, HR can do that, leaders can do that, managers can do that, whereby the teams are enabled to give feedback on certain things. And I think in the pandemic, many CEOs found an ability to do this. Suddenly they were asking people how they were, they were giving feedback, perhaps they went live every week yeah. on Zoom or something. They, you know, they were sharing and then the pandemic ended and so did that, right? So suddenly they're not talking to them anymore. But that for me is such a loss. You don't only talk to people when the world is about to end, right? What about the rest of the time? So maybe you can't do it every week, but you could do it every yeah. two months or every three months, right? Go online, go live, invite them to come if, if they want, tell them about the business, tell them what's going on, inspire them, motivate them, or give them context, right? To why there's redundancies or difficult decisions ahead. And then give them the opportunity to feed back. That could be a poll. You know, that could literally be a poll that says how many of you agree with, you know, what I said today to how many of you is our sustainability agenda important, whatever. People just like to be heard. So I think also there's there's many ways that we can do that in big organizations um, and of course in, in the smaller ones too. You're very right because uh, if I remember very well during the pandemic as well, you know, our people team, they used to have almost um, weekly check-ins you know, because everyone was remote. So they'll call you every week and just say, how are you doing? You know, how's it going? And then when we got back to the office, you know, it's they maintained awesome. that, but the frequency wasn't as much. And then when we have town hall meetings, you actually have people say, um, people tea. It was really nice when you used to call us very often. It would be good <laughs> yes. if you could keep that up, you know. Uh, maybe not as often as obviously during the pandemic, but yes, we really appreciated it. And you're absolutely right. And then also um, running polls as well to just keep feeling the pulse of um, employees. I think that's very key. And your second point about um, listening to customers, you know, mm -hmm. for us as a SaaS company too, I think that has been key for us. You know, so, some level of, so that gives you some level of research because from a product perspective, you can sort of develop a product having an idea of what you think the customer wants, but for it to be able to land, you know, you can't cross that or you can't get to that point until you actually speak to customers. And mm -hmm. what I found from, you know, how we, you know, do some level of, you know, primary research, you know, aside from carrying out surveys, we actually do in a, quite a bit of um, immersion, market immersion. So you speak to the customers, you sit with them throughout the day and see what their day-to-day -day behavior is like. You know, only when you do that, are you even able to unlock some use cases that you didn't even think of? Because the way you think about, you know, the use of your products might be different from how the kind of problems your product is actually solving for each customer. So that point about actually listening, 
is and that really makes the difference especially when you're looking for product market fit right if yeah it, that's the only way you can actually get it done so that's actually very powerful if you think about it from an empathy perspective you know mm -hmm. as a channel or as a tool um to get your product market fit so that kind of takes me to my next question which is to use empathy for for businesses to use empathy as a strategic tool um, mm. or approach you know how can they i've already mentioned one so if there are other use cases you can sort of um share with us how can they how can businesses use this you know as a way to as a way to you know reach their objectives so in terms of driving sales in terms of um, retaining customers ensuring customer loyalty how can so businesses that are, are watching or marketers that are watching how can we you know how does the rubber hit the road when it comes to empathy you know how does it help me meet the business objectives which is maybe you know retaining customers making money hitting my revenue targets and all of that yeah look i think we've touched on a few of them but to, to add to them i mean so of course there is as, as we've touched on your employees so if we start at the core i've touched on it already you know your people are your profit right you need your team to be cohesive to be motivated to be aligned to know the vision of the business to not resign every two months you know so the first one we, which we've touched on a lot already is your employees if your team is strong your sales will grow right we know that okay. um, i think the second is to be in you know context of the market and what the market needs are which is what you were just touching on right understanding how people are using your product what they want from it how they're using it those types of things um beyond that you know all human beings want to be heard it is a an evolutionary motivation it is built into our brains um so when you're with for example with you know with potential clients as i touched on earlier being curious about why they might work with you um is super helpful on a couple of levels we talked earlier about them feeling um you know more loyalty more trust more relationships we also talked about you having more insight um that helps you with things like marketing because it may be that you send the same emails to every potential lead but once you've got higher empathy for those leads you can simply change the subject line the first paragraph the way you sign off something that shows that client that you understand them right it's not just another email that's been copy and pasted right so if your sales team has understood the client has got some of their context and then when they write back they say, you know, dear Mimi, I was fascinated to hear that you blah, 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 and that you're looking at this, then they can copy and paste, you know, the standard response. Um, so these things often used by salesmen naturally, they probably just don't know that what they're using is empathy, which is the skill set to really understand um, the market. And of course, we know as marketers and salespeople that it is cheaper to retain than to replace, right? Yeah. So we know that businesses with higher levels of empathy with their customers retain more clients and then they organically grow those clients because when clients feel that you get them you understand them you deliver what they need they give you more business right because the the, the next competition doesn't so really i think it's, it's across all of those levels starting from the internal team and motivating your sales teams and getting motivation that, that they actually want you know i had a client also in india recently who said to me but Mimi, we keep raising their salaries, but it's not helping. They're still resigning. So I wow. said, well, have you asked them what it is they want? And they were like, well, no, we just assumed they wanted more money. And I said, but they're still resigning. They said, yes. I said, well, then they obviously don't want more money. Um, and one of the insights that came back after they did this empathy exercise, they asked their teams what they wanted. One of the things, very small thing, um, was a new coffee machine. I mean, that's it. They just want a decent coffee, right? It's far cheaper than nine pay rises. So that was one, one example, right? But of understanding what motivates your sales teams. Yes, they want money. All salesmen want commission. But what is it beyond that that's going to keep them with you versus the competition? And how do you actually work into that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. So, you know, even from our perspective, I'll just give you two examples. Um, let me know if this actually you know, ties into, I, I kind of think that that was part of the reason why this solution sort of um, developed. So for instance, if you think about um, the current massive migration we're seeing in uh, why Nigeria, I guess, so there's a whole phenomenon, you know, it's called Jackba, that's what they call it here, you know, but it's really about this massive migration out of the country, you know, um, to other countries. So you find that some businesses perhaps this is their interpretation of showing empathy 
you know, you think about business, sorry, um, families getting, you know, separated because one person is still here and then some people, you know, some other parts of the family are out of the country. So offering things like airtime rewards and data that allows them to communicate with their um, families abroad, whether it's through WhatsApp, you know, for audiovisual or just being able to make calls, you know, things like that. And then another thing is another solution you know, um, which I think was also fueled um, by empathy was, you know, sometimes you have like payment friction with, um, so if you think about how businesses try to promote themselves using channels like Facebook and Instagram. So you find that, you know, companies who are able to fix that payment friction. So if you have issues, if customers are having issues with card payments, for instance, so you have a telco come and say, you know what, maybe you can maybe use airtime or a bank come in to say i can help facilitate this so that you can use a different way of making these payments and run your business effectively without having to deal with forex issues or card payment issues so off the top of my head those are sort of simple examples of how when it comes to product development that um, businesses are able to demonstrate empathy do, do you do you have any of such examples you know that you've seen um, businesses do in terms of product development targeted at consumers sort of from an empathy perspective one of the things we see is that in pro-social sort of collectivist societies which most of africa is right historically you go back to kind of tribal times the african continent on the whole again bit of a stereotype but on the whole is a collectivist society as as much as latin america as as much as south asia but less so in kind of the north and the west of the world where they're far more individualistic societies. When we see collectivist societies, you see innovation in these ways that you're, you're talking about there, which is real thinking about how to um, enable and empower en masse, like you said, by giving them solutions that allow them to do things differently. And having worked a lot in Africa, I think a lot of that um, does come from there. I think Airbnb, um, do you have Airbnb in Nigeria? We do. There we go. Um, they are um, a platform who really do understand their their merchants or sellers, the people that are using it to um, you know to create services out of their home or their properties. Um, I think they are they have many innovations that help those people become entrepreneurs, right? Especially in the pandemic. Um, and one of the examples of that, I would say, and this is a great example of tech enabling or empowering women as well. Yeah is that they found ways for many women to create business when they couldn't work in the pandemic by cooking food or you know once the pandemic ended or the lockdowns ended um there's now a part of airbnb called airbnb experiences where you can you know give people tours of your city you can drive them places you can offer them cooking classes sewing classes pottery all kinds of things right so airbnb as a platform recognized this need for people to they had a craft they were a great baker they wanted to you know get that skill out into the world but they didn't have the means as you were saying there with businesses they didn't have a platform they couldn't take payments they couldn't reach people airbnb created airbnb experiences which has enabled them to connect their skill and the market um equally they have things around security so you know women run uh, residences where women run women or female run homes different ways to secure that you know because obviously you're letting people into your house so um i think uber as well um do you have uber in nigeria we do <laughs> you don't have it in asia that's why i ask you know uber is not you, mean, you need to come to nigeria so you yeah, don't I need so to come. ask these questions <laughs> yeah i need to come you've been to west <laughs> south africa which other countries in africa i've been to south africa i've been to namibia but i've never been up further than that okay. um it's an open and invitation. There's an, it has an invitation. And do you know, it's always sad to me, especially at the moment, I'm speaking to you from Malaysia and we don't have either of those brands here. And we don't have Uber Eats. We have all local brands, which I love, right? Because everywhere else you go, you use Uber or whatever. But you know, here there's a, in Southeast Asia, there's a company called Grab, which I think yeah. might be bigger than Uber. Um, but here in this part of the world, if you say Uber, nobody knows what it is, right? It doesn't exist because Grab is it. Um, in Dubai, we have Deliveroo for yeah. food deliveries. I think it's in England as well. Um, but here it's it's not a thing. So you never know, right, who's who's doing what. But um, 
I think Airbnb and Uber are both brands that globally have done a good job to empower people to connect their craft and the audience. And I think those are very empathetic evolutions, inspirations, innovations, because without understanding their target, which in this case is the, you know, the owners, they wouldn't have created those, uh, those innovations for the market. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Nidhi, so just in rounding this up, some key takeaways um, for me. One is um, yeah, listening leadership, like you've talked about. Um, I think that's very key, both internally and even extending it externally. Um, and then the second point is um, empathy, actually able, sorry, being able to contribute to the bottom line of businesses yeah. from listening to customers and actually aligning customer needs um to what is being um, developed i mean that's the only way you can gain adoption and actually scale and that literally ties to bottom line and mm -hmm. when you think about saving costs as well so um like you said listening leadership um listening to um the staff in generally you're able to retain more staff and when you have a stronger sales team you can actually do a lot more so being able to directly tie empathy to the business bottom line i think it's very key and then the insights, obviously, in from you know speaking to customers um, externally as well as speaking to staff internally, you know key insights would help to unlock growth opportunities as businesses. And I'll end with your last speech, which you said, "All humans want to be heard." <laughs> I think if if you don't go away anything, always remember that all humans want to be heard. So I think that can be applied not just even in business spaces, even in our personal lives, you know, how we deal with each other from, you know, family to friends to colleagues to just if you think about it from that perspective, the fact that the other person just wants to be heard and then, you know, put your listening ear on and listen with your heart as well. It can unlock quite a lot of opportunities. So maybe I'll just let you, I'll just let you round up with a few words and then we'll just we'll round it up. No, I think you did a, a beautiful example, a sort of example there of summarizing everything we said. I guess, you know, there's, there's two things I'll, I'll end with. The first is that the more the world talks about empathy, the more empathy the world will have. And that's why this conversation is so important because we're not only talking about business growth and driving your bottom line, but we're just talking about being decent human beings and filling the gaps. When empathy is low, all of the isms, racism, ageism, sexism, nationalism, all of the isms go up, right? We create segregation in society. So yes, it's about bottom line, but it's also about rebuilding our, our societies, our communities and our businesses. And then the second thing I would say to end is that we're all more alike than we are different. And empathy allows us to understand that, right? To really understand that at the core, Everyone is motivated by the same things. We want to be seen. We want to be heard. We want to be safe. We want to be loved. We want to progress. We want to grow. We want to be inspired. You know, whatever you, wherever you come from, whoever you worship, whatever job you do, you know, whether you're a parent or not, all of us are more alike than we are different. And I think if we could consider that in our businesses a little more often, we would be able to sustain sort of happier, more high performing and more sustainably well workplaces. Thank you very much, Mimi. It was, it was a fantastic time I just had with you. Thank you, thank you. Hopefully thank you we'll get to see you soon. Yes, I'm on my way. Yes. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mimi.